in a scene that's more startling than my last tea spill, a chap is diligently scrubbing the inside of a building, only to have his routine upended by a body crash landing on a truck outside. Quite the conversation starter, I'd say. Meanwhile, in a diner, two blokes chat about the joys of alcoholism and the rather sticky wicket of forgiveness, especially for the suit-clad fellow who's wrestling with the bottle. He laments how tricky forgiveness is, given a family tragedy five years prior, yearning for the good old days of banner about the weather and cricket scores. Fast forward, and the man in the suit is not just any patron but a detective. He sashays past a police line to a crime scene where his colleague shows off a truck sporting a new look, a dead body as a hood ornament. He inspects the unfortunate soul and casts an eye to the heavens, or rather, the surrounding buildings. Puzzled by the physics of such a fall, his detective mate is equally baffled, unable to fathom such a leap from the modest buildings around. But, plot twist, our keen detective spots a curious lack of shattered glass near the truck, deducing that the body took a bit of a roll before the final curtain. The two gumshoes amble around the corner, seeking a building more fitting for this high-flying act. Next up, a parade of characters outside a swanky skyscraper. First, a brooding bloke in a hoodie, then a dapper gent with a red tie, followed by a security guard yapping on the phone, and an old lady looking as lost as a left sock in a laundromat. A young lady makes her entrance, halted by the guard, and queues up to sign the guest book, adding a touch of normalcy to an otherwise bizarre day. In a twist that could rival a British soap opera, our security guard, doubling as an impromptu courier, announces he's off to play Santa to the 39th floor. The elevator, akin to a London bus, is too packed for our red-tied chap and the old lady, who seem as eager to get on as tourists at the Tower of London. They opt for the next lift, which, like a proper English queue, forms in an orderly fashion behind them. As they step in, our security guard, perhaps fancying himself as a lift operator from yesteryears, joins the party. In a dramatic last-minute entrance worthy of a West End play, the young woman from earlier sprints in. Following her, the hoodie-wearing gentleman, who clearly missed the memo on elevator etiquette, forces the doors open and hops in. The elevator, now a microcosm of a crowded pub on a Friday night, begins its ascent, only to halt with the abruptness of a double-decker in a traffic jam. Meanwhile, in a scene straight out of a local pub, an older security guard is engrossed in a hockey game, oblivious to the developing drama. His younger colleague, perhaps less sports-inclined, spots the elevator kerfuffle and nudges the elder to ring the building engineer. The engineer, busy with a broken window as if vandals had a go at it, is directed to the more pressing matter of the stuck elevator. Inside this metal box of social awkwardness, the temp security guard is about as useful as a chocolate teapot, clueless about emergency protocol. The chap in the red tie, clearly unimpressed with the lack of walkie-talkie act, joins the old lady in grilling the poor temp, turning the situation into a bizarre elevator inquisition. Just when you think it couldn't get more absurd than a British sitcom, a voice crackles through the elevator's calm system like an overzealous narrator in a mystery play, announcing the obvious, they're stuck. The older security guard, playing the role of the unseen oracle, asks for a sound check, only to discover the microphone is as functional as a chocolate fire guard. Down in the elevator, our security guard, in a moment of inspired uselessness, attempts a call to the lobby. As luck would have it, his phone's about as connected as a hermit. The young woman, perhaps more in tune with the modern world, lends him her phone, but alas, the call is shorter than a British summer. To add to the delight, music starts playing in the elevator, and the red-tie fellow, mistaking the situation for a talent show, begins a serenade that's as welcome as a rain cloud at a picnic. Meanwhile, our beleaguered engineer, battling the elements like a character in a British farce, is nearly sent flying off the roof in a gust of wind. Back on terra firma, the detectives, having a chinwag, stumble upon glass littering the pavement like breadcrumbs in a fairy tale. They shoo away a man sweeping up the evidence as if it were just a minor spillage in all three, declaring the area a crime scene with the flair of a stage actor. As if on cue, a dramatic chunk of glass nearly does in one of the detectives, reinforcing their suspicions with the subtlety of a sledgehammer. Up in the shaft, the engineer, in a scene reminiscent of a budget spy thriller, inspects the elevator. He radios to say all looks shipshape but promises a reset, as if hitting the refresh button on a dodgy internet connection. Finally, back in our vertically challenged elevator, the elder security guard, perhaps fancying himself a bit of a director, announces a 20-second blackout, no doubt adding to the already rising tension like a kettle about to whistle. In a scene as dark as a British comedy set in a coal mine, the lights in the elevator plunge the group into darkness. When they flicker back to life, the old lady, in a performance worthy of an Oscar, screams at the security guard as if he's a ghost at a seance. He apologizes, confessing his claustrophobia, which is about as helpful as a fishnet umbrella in a downpour. In a stroke of DIY genius, the third man pops open a panel, and fresh air floods in, providing a welcome reprieve from the stale atmosphere that's been building up like tension at a family reunion. The security guard, ever the optimist, wonders if they should channel their inner Spider-Man and climb up the cable. The voice of reason, however, suggests that ascending the elevator shaft is about as wise as a chocolate teapot. Back in the machine room, the engineer, in a conversation as riveting as watching paint dry, checks if his magical reset button worked. Spoiler alert, it didn't. He decides to play detective and scurry off to the basement for a gander. Meanwhile, 
the guards in the security office are nattering about the broken window and the potential human projectile from earlier that day, with the younger guard exhibiting the concern of a mother hen. Back in the elevator, Red Tie Man, in a move as smooth as sandpaper, hands his business card to the old lady. A riveting conversation ensues, sparked by a Sherlock Holmes-esque observation on the socioeconomic status based on attire, because, obviously, that's what you discuss in a stuck elevator. He compares the old lady's style to the young woman's, causing her to turn away in a huff. However, she quickly accuses him of a rather cheeky indiscretion just as the lights start their disco routine again. In the main office, the older guard, playing the role of a concerned parent, radios the engineer to ask if he's the mastermind behind the light show. The engineer, peeking at the elevators from below like a curious cat, assures him that all seems well on his end. He then fiddles with a lever, probably hoping it does something more useful than a do not push button. In a plot twist as predictable as a British weather forecast, the older security guard informs our intrepid engineer that his reset efforts were about as effective as a chocolate radiator. Unfazed, the engineer decides to head to the roof to reset it manually, because, of course, the solution is always on the roof. Meanwhile, back in the elevator, the lights perform a flickering dance more erratic than a Morris dancer after one too many pints. In the main office, the younger guard, as glued to the screen, spots something that sends shivers down his spine, akin to hearing unexpected noises in a British country house at night. The engineer, now playing hide and seek with strange noises under the elevators, experiences a near miss with a plummeting elevator, adding a touch of action movie thrill to his otherwise mundane day. In the elevator, the lights are out, and eerie noises fill the space, as if they're in a low-budget horror film set in a haunted house. When the lights graciously decide to return, the young woman is on the ground, sparking a panic as contagious as a yawn in a board meeting. Red Tie Man, now with a mysterious blood stain on him, tries to play it cool, resembling a child caught with his hand in the cookie jar. The young woman claims it felt like a bite, prompting a search for sharp objects, because evidently, the elevator wasn't quite thrilling enough. The security guard, now playing detective, notices the blood on Red Tie Man and frisks him, suspecting he might be hiding more than just a poor fashion sense. Back in the main office, the guards decide it's time to call the police, recognizing that an elevator assault is slightly above their pay grade. Outside, the detective from the diner, who was previously pondering over glass shards, receives the call about the elevator drama, adding another layer to the already thickening plot. The detective, upon realizing the call involves the building with the enigmatic broken window, eagerly grabs the case like a child with a new toy, dragging his partner along for what promises to be a thrilling episode of Elevator Mystery. Back at the security office, the younger guard, playing detective himself, triumphantly presents the footage of the strange anomaly he observed. The older guard, embodying the skepticism of a disillusioned Sherlock Holmes, dismisses it as mere grain, because in a world where elevators bite people, grainy footage is where he draws the line. The younger guard clutches his cross, convinced he's witnessed evil incarnate, while the elder attempts to soothe his fears, likely pondering if it's too late to switch careers. In the elevator, our makeshift heroes, the security guard and the third man, attempt to pry open the doors with the determination of contestants in a reality TV survival show. However, their knowledge of elevator shafts is about as extensive as a Londoner's understanding of country life. The old lady, in a state of dread reminiscent of a character in a Victorian ghost story, fears they're dangling over the abyss, ready to plummet at any moment. Red Tie Man, now relegated to the back of the elevator like a naughty schoolboy, tries to assist but is under the watchful eye of his fellow captives, who still suspect him of the mysterious assault. Meanwhile, our detectives arrive at the main security office, turning the drama up a notch. The older guard briefs them on the assault, pointing the finger of suspicion at Red Tie Man, who's about as popular now as a fox in a hen house. The lead detective, after sizing up the situation, calls for reinforcements from the elevator company and the fire brigade, possibly expecting a climax more explosive than Guy Fawkes' night. His interest piqued by the temp security guard inside the elevator, the detective instructs the security office to dig up his files, no doubt expecting revelations as startling as finding a teabag in an American kitchen. In a scene reminiscent of a Monty Python sketch, the younger guard, ever the believer in supernatural shenanigans, recounts his eerie observation from the footage. The older guard, maintaining his role as the skeptic-in-chief, brushes it off like dandruff on a black jacket. The detective, equally unimpressed and practical as a British plumber, asks the trapped souls in the elevator to flash their IDs at the camera. Alas, the writing is as legible as a doctor's prescription, leading our sleuths and the senior security guard to the lobby to check the visitor's log, because why not add a dash of paperwork to this already bizarre ordeal? Back in the main office, the younger guard keeps a vigilant eye on the elevator camera. Inside the lift, the lights perform their now familiar flickering act, and in a twist that would make Agatha Christie blink, the young woman hallucinates a macabre scene of her fellow passengers as lifeless, bloodied body. Then, in a blink, normalcy returns, as if someone's playing a cruel game of supernatural peekaboo. The lights then go full blackout mode, a mirror shatters, adding to the ambience of a low-budget horror flick, 
and strange noises echo in the dark. When illumination graces them once more, Red Tie Man is revealed with a neck accessorized by a shard of glass, making a rather grim fashion statement. Meanwhile, the younger guard, now in the role of the doomsayer, summons the detectives back to witness the chilling development. Seeing Red Tie Man's untimely demise, the lead detective calls for backup, probably wishing he'd chosen a career in accounting. As they review the footage, the young guard, in a moment of dramatic flair, begins narrating a tale as if auditioning for a role in a gothic novel. He speaks of suicides, injuries, and the devil's penchant for human form and torment. His ominous conclusion suggests the devil might be playing a starring role in this elevator drama, adding a theological twist to an already perplexing day. The detectives, displaying the kind of disinterest usually reserved for a dentist's waiting room, continue to scrutinize the footage. They cast suspicious glances at the security guard in the elevator, whose file apparently has more red flags than a bullfighter's convention. Meanwhile, the occupants of the elevator engage in a whodunit debate, resembling a game of Cluedo gone awry. In a timely entrance, the fire brigade arrives, adding a touch of heroism to the scene. The detective, now in communication with the elevator's inhabitants, declares it a crime scene with the gravitas of a Shakespearean actor. He's skeptical about the incident being accidental and notes that the group doesn't exactly scream serial killers. In a moment of inspiration, he asks for a volunteer from the elevator's cast to extract a letter from the dearly departed's pocket. The letter, held up like a trophy catch, reveals that the deceased was to meet someone in the building, thickening the plot like a good stew. The detectives then rendezvous with the fire department, while the diner detective ventures to the part of the building with the ominous broken window. There, forensics present him with a suicide note that reads like a draft from an Edgar Allan Poe novel complete with a chilling mention of the devil's footsteps. Outside the elevator, the firemen, showcasing the determination of a British bulldog, attempt to pry the doors open, to no avail. Inside, one of the men, in a desperate bid for freedom, tries to climb out, only to be yanked back by the security guard, who seems to think he's in a prison break drama. The plot thickens as the detective speaks with the person who was due to meet the deceased from the elevator, adding yet another layer of mystery to this already convoluted tale. In a plot twist more tangled than a British roundabout, the detective discovers that our dearly departed Red Tie Man was a scam artist, as charming and trustworthy as a fox in a henhouse. He requests a list of the scam souls, perhaps hoping to add a dash of detective work to the mix. Meanwhile, back in the elevator, the occupants, embracing their inner Sherlock Holmes, begin frisking each other with a fervor usually reserved for airport security. Over at the main security office, the detective, playing the role of a modern-day Hercule Poirot, deduces that one of the elevator's motley crew likely didn't sign in, because surely no murderer would be daft enough to leave a paper trail. He hands over the scam victim's list to his partner for a spot of comparative analysis, then turns his attention to the young guard's footage. In a moment of cinematic drama, he reveals an apology note from the person responsible for his own family tragedy, musing that evil needs no diabolical assistance. As they chat, the older guard, now a makeshift film reviewer, spots the moment the young woman claims she was grabbed, but the footage suggests she's as truthful as a politician's promise. The detective now casts a suspicious eye her way. Back in the elevator, tensions rise like steam in a tea kettle, culminating in the old lady threatening to pepper spray the security guard. In a move as swift as a cricket catch, he snatches the spray from her, adding a touch of action to the already chaotic scene. Meanwhile, in the security office, the older guard is on the blower to the engineer, lamenting his Houdini-like disappearance. The engineer, meanwhile, is having a bit of a do climbing down the elevator cable, struggling to get a peep out of his walkie-talkie, probably wondering if his day could get any more surreal. In a scene more gripping than a British soap opera cliffhanger, the engineer, in a stunt worthy of a budget action movie, slips down the cable, causing a chain from his gear to dramatically tear open. Inside the elevator, the security guard, now resembling a schoolboy with a mischievous secret, taunts the old lady with the expired pepper spray, because, apparently, expired goods are the height of humor in a crisis. Suddenly, a thud resounds atop the elevator, like an unexpected plot twist in a detective novel. Blood ominously seeps in from the top panel, as if they're in a scene straight out of a horror flick. The walkie-talkie crackles to life, leading them to the grim realization that the engineer has made an unplanned and rather permanent stop on their elevator. Unable to break through the panel to offer aid, the detective ascends to the roof for a bird's eye view of the tragedy and confirms the engineer's dire fate. He advises a channel switch for the walkie-talkie and orders the fire department to commence a dramatic rescue through the elevator wall, like night storming a castle. Meanwhile, back at the main security office, they discover the old lady's penchant for light-fingered wallet lifting, painting a picture of the elevator as a den of not-so-innocent souls. The detective, in a moment of cynicism that would impress a British tabloid editor, remarks on the questionable morality of the trapped group. The security camera feed, with a sense of dramatic timing, glitches to show a grisly image of the passenger seemingly deceased, a vision visible only to the cop. Next, they spot footage of the third man entering the lobby with a satchel, mysteriously absent in the elevator. As the lights in the elevator resume their flickering dance, the security guard, in a move as cliché as lighting a candle in a power cut, strikes a mat. Beside him, 
something strange lurks, adding yet another layer of mystery to this increasingly bizarre and macabre situation. In a moment more chilling than a British winter, the lights return to reveal the old lady, now hauntingly suspended on one side of the elevator, lifeless. The detective, witnessing this macabre scene, promptly calls for a building lockdown, hurting everyone to the lobby like sheep to a pen. The older guard, possibly seeking a moment of peace, heads to the basement. Back in the security office, the detective and the younger guard are the sole occupant. The younger guard, embracing his role as the doom prophet, suggests they are all part of a devilish audience, adding a touch of existential dread to the proceeding. In the elevator, the two men gently lower the old lady's body, in a scene as somber as a rainy day in London. Meanwhile, the detectives, playing a real-life game of hide-and-seek, discover the elusive satchel in a restroom filled with tools that could possibly rig an elevator, because obviously, the plot needed more entry. Left to his own devices in the main office, the younger guard begins reciting prayers over the comm system, adding a spiritual dimension to the unfolding drama. The elevator's occupants, however, are not fans of his sermon. A scuffle breaks out between the two men, escalating like a bar brawl. The young woman, in a moment of desperation, urges the security guard to dispatch the other man, turning the elevator into a scene more suited for a gladiatorial arena. Back in the main office, the detectives return to find the guard mid-prayer and witness the chaos in the elevator. They swiftly instruct everyone to back off and assume a position against the walls, bringing a semblance of order to the chaos. As calm is restored, the cop inquires about the end of the younger guard's grim tale. The guard ominously predicts their demise, adding a layer of fatalism to the mix. His partner then reveals that the young woman also has a checkered past, adding yet another twist to this already convoluted narrative. In a scene as frantic as a British tea time when the biscuits run out, the detectives dash to the lobby and confront the lawyer. His advice? A cryptic hint to investigate those closest to the young woman and a nod to his expertise in forensic accounting, adding yet another layer to this already dense mystery cake. The detective, diving deeper into this rabbit hole, requests a phone call with the woman's husband. Meanwhile, in the basement, the old security guard, in a move as surprising as finding a sunny day in London, turns off the water. He notifies the firemen, who continue their demolition of the wall with the enthusiasm of children in a sweet shop. The guard, in his basement adventure, stumbles upon a wire submerged in water and attempts to extricate it. In a dramatic turn of events, screams echo through the lobby as he collapses, the gathered crowd witnessing his sudden demise. Back in the elevator, the remaining trio erupts into an argument, mirroring a heated debate in the Houses of Parliament. The detectives, returning to the office, speculate that the young woman's husband, who conveniently owns the security company, might be the puppet master behind this macabre theater. The cops now suspect the security guard in the elevator, theorizing that the other casualties were merely distractions in a sinister plot. In a recurring nightmare scenario, the lights in the elevator plunge into darkness again. The detective advises using phone screens as makeshift torches, but in a twist as unexpected as a plot in a British detective novel, the phones are mysteriously snatched from their hand. When the lights return, they reveal the security guard, now tragically still, adding to the body count. The remaining two, in a state of panic, arm themselves with shards of glass, ready for a showdown. Desperate for a solution, the detective seeks wisdom from the younger guard, who cryptically suggests that they confront their true selves, a philosophical musing as profound as a late-night conversation in a British pub. In a moment as gripping as the final scene of a British crime drama, the detective, in a bid to lower tensions, shares a personal tale, asking the survivors to drop their makeshift glass weapon. They comply, though as reluctantly as a child parting with their candy. But then, in a twist darker than a London fog, the lights go out, plunging them into darkness once more. When they flicker back to life, the young woman is tragically sprawled on the floor, a shard of glass lodged in her throat. The man tries to help her, but the scene takes a turn for the supernatural as the old lady, now an embodiment of the devil, looms ominously, declaring it's the man's turn. The man is thrust into a harrowing flashback. He's driving, beer in hand, when he collides with another car. He discovers the other vehicle in a ditch, a woman pinned underneath, pointing to her child lying in the grass, a scene as heart-wrenching as any tragic opera. Back in the elevator, the man, engulfed in remorse, pleads with the devil, in the guise of the old lady, to take him instead of the young woman. But the devil, unyielding in her demands, sends the elevator plunging down the shaft. Miraculously, it halts. The man, finding the engineer's radio, confesses his sins to the detective and the young guard, who listen with the intensity of jurors at a trial. Inside the elevator, the young woman passes away in his arms, the devil expressing her frustration at being denied her intended victim. As the lights flicker yet again, the firemen finally breach the elevator doors, revealing the man as the sole survivor, spared by the devil's cruel whim. The old lady, the devil in disguise, has vanished into thin air. Later, as paramedics remove the bodies, the detective encounters the man in the lobby. He reveals a startling twist. It was his own family the man had tragically killed that fateful day. In a moment of profound forgiveness, the detective absolves him of his guilt. The last scene shows the detective and the man in a car, the man seated in the back, as the detective shares his forgiveness, closing the chapter on this harrowing tale. If this narrative had you on the edge of your seat, clinging to every word like a suspenseful cliffhanger, then please, 
do show your appreciation. Like a maestro appreciating applause, we thrive on your support. So, go on, give that like button a click, share this gripping saga with your comrades, and subscribe for more tales that unravel like a mystery novel. Your engagement is the encore we eagerly await.